I have a couple of announcements this morning. Uh, we'd like to remember Billy Watson. She was in the hospital a couple of days this week with some uh, heart issues and blood pressure issues. Uh, she goes back to see the heart doctor Wednesday, so let's keep her in her prayers, please. Also, Steve McCorder has had a couple of tests run, and uh, let's pray for good results on those tests, please. Uh, also, uh, Bruce Watson is going into the Army this Sunday, so let's pray with him, please. Are there any other announcements I need to make today? No. Okay, let's get our hymn books. And... Uh, wait a minute, I got one thing. Sorry about that. We have a thank you note from uh, Kevin and Linda Bonner. It says, uh, thank you so much for the cards and prayers, food and kind thoughts and words during Kevin's surgery and recovery. We have been uh, solely blessed, Kevin and Linda. Okay. Now, is there anything else? Okay, let's get our some books. Well, let's look at the, the monitor. <laughs> Walking in Sunlight, and uh, for those at home, uh, it's page 611 in our hymn books. Two verses of heavenly, <laughs> heavenly sunlight. Let us sing. Walking in sunlight all of my journey over the mountains through the deep hell. Jesus has said, I'll never forsake the promise divine that never can fail. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah. I am rejoicing, singing his prayer, says Jesus is mine. In the bright sunlight, ever rejoicing, pressing my way to mansions above. Singing his praises, gladly I'm walking, walking in sunlight, sunlight of love. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing his praise, Jesus is mine. Next song is Higher Ground, page 539, 539. I am pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these are found, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand 
by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Our next song together is How Shall the Young Secure Their Hearts? It's page 432. 432. How shall the young secure their hearts and guard their lives from sin? Thy word, the choicest rules, imparts to keep the conscience clean. To keep the conscience clean. Thy word is everlasting truth. How pure is every age that holy book shall guide our youth and well support our age and well support our age pure pure in heart O God 671, 671. Pure in heart, O oh God, help me to be. May I devote my life wholly to Thee. Watch thou my wayward feet, guide me with counsel sweet, pure in heart, help me to be. God help me to be that I thy holy face one day may see keep me from secret sin my soul within pure and heart help me to be and our song before our prayer and scripture reading break thou the bread of life that's page 431, 431. Break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me, as thou didst break the loaves beside the sea. Beyond the sacred page, I seek thee, Lord. My spirit pants for thee, O living word. Bless thou the truth, dear Lord, to me 
bitter me as thou didst bless the bread by Galilee. There shall all bondage cease, all fetters fall, and I shall find my peace, my all all. Scripture reading this morning coming from the book of Isaiah, from the 40th chapter. Verses 3 through 5. A voice cries, In the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough pass a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Let's go to our God in prayer. Dear Lord, our God, we thank you for this day you've given to us. Lord, we thank you for all the blessings we have in this life. Most of all, the blessing it is to be a Christian and have the blood of your Son wash us of our sins. Lord, we pray as we continue through this worship service that it will be acceptable to you that we may worship you in spirit and in truth. And that you will forgive us of the sins we commit, Lord. It's in your Son's name that we pray. Amen. Good morning. Welcome again to the services of the Parish Church of Christ. We're so grateful for the opportunity to gather together today and worship our good God. And we're grateful for those who are joining us online in real time as well as those who are watching the recording of this service. Our country has experienced quite a bit of unrest in recent months and weeks. Uh, we have seen protesters and rioters that reveal a deep divide in our nation and testify to racial tensions. And whatever we may feel or think about those protests and those riots and those issues that have arisen, I think we can all identify with a desire for justice. A desire for justice. In Malachi's day, the people of God ask, where is the God of justice? And the answer that they receive in Malachi chapter 2 verse 17 and through chapter 3 verse 5 is, Judgment is coming. And I want to notice with you this morning this text. The people of God ask, where is justice? And we find his answer from the mouth of the prophet. We notice, first of all, the protest of the people of God. In verse 17 in Malachi 2, the prophet says, You have wearied the Lord with your words. But you say, how have we wearied him? By saying, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or by asking, where is the God of justice? You may recall when we began our study that we noticed a pattern that appears in Malachi's prophetic writings. Uh, that pattern involves God making a statement of truth and the people objecting to God's statement of truth in the form of a question. And then God answering their objections through the prophet. And this happens six times in the book. 
We've already noticed three of these times. We, when we began our study, we noticed that the people doubted God's love. They said, how have you loved us? And as we continue on, we see the people not only questioning God's love, but also questioning His majesty and His faithfulness or His fidelity. But here, at chapter 2, verse 17, they're questioning His justice. They're questioning His justice. Where is the God of justice? Now, this is uh, uh, perhaps due in part to their context. You may recall that uh, when we began the study, we came to recognize that these are people who have returned from captivity. They have rebuilt the city of Jerusalem and its walls. They have rebuilt the temple within that city. And it is not as grand as the temple that Solomon built. And if we look back in our Old Testaments, go ahead and turn back for just a moment to the book of Leviticus, chapter 16. Even before the temple was built, when God gave instruction to the children of Israel as they were leaving Egypt to build the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant, what we find is that from the earliest time, God... We'll come back to Romans 9. From the earliest time... God filled the presence of the temple. God filled the tabernacle and then the temple. In Leviticus chapter 16, the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they drew near before the Lord and died. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat that is on the ark so that he may not die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. Now that's in the setting of the tabernacle. When we come forward into 1 Kings chapter 8, and Solomon has built the temple, and the Ark of the Covenant is brought into the temple, and it is dedicated, we find once more that this cloud overshadows the Ark of the Covenant so that the priest cannot even stand to be inside the temple. And so the children of Israel now living in Malachi's day have, ob have observed something. There is no cloud in the temple. And so the children of Israel ask, where is the God of justice? But there's a problem with the question that they ask. You notice the prophet says that they have wearied God with their words. And we already noticed those accusations, those questions that they have leveled at God leading up to this point. And this problem reveals a number of things about the children of Israel. First of all, it reveals their arrogance. That they think that they have the right to question God. And now, Romans 9 verse 20, Paul says in an adaptation of Isaiah's words, but who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Well, what is molded say to its molder? Why have you made me like this? They were arrogant enough to think that they were in a place to judge God, to question Him. But not only that, but in their accusation, in their question, in saying everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, they imply that they were worthy and yet did not have certain things from God. They said, well, look at all these evil people around us who have all of these good things. We're, the implication is, the righteous ones, we're the ones who deserve these good things. God. And so not only were they arrogant in judging Him, but they said, we're righteous. And yet, God does not come back and say, oh, you're right. But instead, the answer that follows in Malachi 3 is this, my justice will be revealed when I come. And we're going to notice that in just a moment. Injustice. We don't like injustice. We especially don't like injustice when we feel like we're the one who has been wrong. Do you ever notice 
When we're in the wrong, we don't want justice. When we're in the wrong, we want mercy. But when someone else is in the wrong, we want justice. The story is told of the millionaire Andrew Carnegie, who at one time was the richest man in the world. He made his millions with steel and other ventures. And he spent a great deal of his time and wealth trying to lift up the impoverished. Matter of fact, at one time, there were public libraries all over this country bearing his name. There are still some Carnegie libraries in existence today. But the story is told that a socialist came to visit Carnegie. And it wasn't long before he began railing against him, saying, you know, it would only be fair if your wealth were divided among... It's not fair for one person to have so much wealth. It ought to be divided among the people and so Carnegie spoke to his secretary and he said I need I need you to tell me just how much I'm worth right now and then I need you to tell me how many people are alive in the world today and he took a notebook and he took those numbers and he took 16 cents out of his pocket And he handed them to the socialists and he said, here is your share of my net worth. Now, if we were to challenge God as the children of Israel did of being unjust, we would have less claim than the socialists did to Andrew Carnegie's 16 cents. Do you ever find yourself doubting God's justice? Sometimes it's hard not to ask, why, isn't it? Uh, This this past week, we lost uh, a dear friend who was a mentor to me, my youth minister, for many years. He was, how old? 60, 60 years old. Very sudden. And his family is taken aback. They have faith. But in, in moments like those, it's, it's not difficult to find ourselves asking, why is it? I want to think about that for just a moment. The children of Israel had no standing to question the justice of God They didn't have the same standing even as the man Job who is described in the Old Testament in the most exalted terms of any human being is described in the whole Bible outside, of course, of Jesus. And yet Job got no answer to his question of why. Even so, I find in the pages of Scripture, often those who are suffering and struggling are recipients of God's mercy. In 1 Kings chapter 19, when Elijah fled from Jezebel after destroying the prophets of Baal, and he was just, oh, woe is me. I'm the only one left. God reassured him. When Thomas said, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and the hole in his side, I will not believe. The Lord gave him that evidence. Jude verse 22 tells us to have mercy on those who doubt. If you find yourself doubting God, I want to encourage you Don't go to anyone else. Take it to God in prayer and hear Him speak in Scripture. I want to say this. You may not find God directly answers your questions. But if you will take your doubts to Him in prayer and in His Word, I am firmly convinced 
that those doubts will be answered. We see first of all that the children of Israel in Malachi's day ask, where is the God of justice? We then see that God offers for them the anticipation of preparation in Malachi 3 and verse 1. The prophet says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. In effect, God promised to appear. Now, uh, we already read that passage from Leviticus. I got ahead of myself. Uh, but once again, in Malachi's day, the Shekinah glory as it has been called, the glory of God, the presence of God was not evident in the temple. Yet God promises in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1, I will come. I will come back. I will come to my temple. Now, this is a, a difficult verse. Uh, matter of fact, that's why I devoted one point to just this one verse, Malachi 3.1, because a lot of things are being said right here. I want you to notice that in the first part of the verse, he says, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way. Adam read for us just a moment ago from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 through 5, which speak of this preparation. When we turn over a few pages from Malachi to our New Testament, to the Gospel accounts, all four of the Gospel accounts apply these verses from Isaiah 40 that Malachi references here to the ministry of John the Baptist. And in a moment we'll read one of those accounts. The second part of the verse that says he will come to his temple uh, addresses that problem that the people saw. And then the last part, the messenger of the covenant. Now, this is difficult. We see my messenger at the first part of the verse, and then we see the messenger of the covenant. And most commentators understand that these are actually two different individuals. The messenger being John the Baptist. The messenger of the covenant being the Messiah, Jesus. And you can see that the messenger will prepare the way and then the messenger of the covenant will come. And so, I want to notice Luke chapter 3. We're going to read in a moment beginning at verse 15, but I want to back up just for the sake of context and see there beginning around verse 3 that John the Baptist appears with a ministry of repentance. He appears proclaiming baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And Luke quotes in verses 4 through 6 the prophecy of Isaiah 40. So then when we come down to verse 15, we see the people were in expectation. And all were questioning in their hearts concerning John whether he might be the Christ. See, they, they saw these things. They saw the way being prepared, and so they were looking for the Messiah. John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing, winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. John's work, his ministry of preparation for the coming of Christ was a ministry of repentance because judgment would appear. The preparation for the coming justice of God was the proclamation of repentance. I can remember living on the campus of Fried Hardeman University and every semester we had something in the dorms that was called uh, health inspection. And the deans uh, over, over the dormitories would come through in what might be called a white glove inspection. Everything had to be spotless. 
And as an RA, there was some added pressure on me that not only my room passed, but uh, all the people on my floor. That came back on my head. We did a lot of thorough cleaning in a short period of time. And you know, being college boys, it really was a short period of time because we put it off as long as we could. I find these days that when I'm doing a thorough cleaning, it's not because someone is going to come by and inspect, but because I'm anticipating company. What would you do if you knew God were coming to visit? How would you prepare? You see, the ministry of John the Baptist prepared the people for the coming of Jesus but now He has come. He is with us. Do we realize how special that is? When Jesus departed in Matthew 28, He told His disciples, I'm with you always to the end of the age. He is with us. Today, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, you know, that looks a little bit different these days than it used to look. But the fundamentals haven't changed. The Lord is with us. As we have sung and will continue to sing praises to His name, He is present. As we study now from His Word, He speaks. The Lord is with us even now. What if you knew that He were going to be seated beside you in worship today? How would your attitude and your actions look different? He's here. He is with us. Have you prepared? Finally, we notice after Malachi reveals the protest and the preparation, he speaks of the purification. Beginning at verse 2, he says... But who can endure the day of His coming? And who can stand when He appears? For He is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver and He will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver and they will bring offerings and righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. The people said, where is the God of justice? And he says, I'm coming and when I come, I will bring my judgment with me. I will divide the pure from the impure. Now, the people didn't recognize what they were asking in saying, where is the God of justice? They were actually inviting their own condemnation upon themselves. Now, this is no different from what we see frequently in Scripture. Matter of fact, uh, we find something very similar in Amos chapter 5, just a few pages backward in your Bible in the Old Testament the first, perhaps, writing prophet, Amos, speaks of the day of the Lord. And he says, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. That is, woe to you who are anticipating, who want the Lord to come among you. Because when He comes, in His righteousness and His holiness, He will judge and He will vindicate. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord, who would have the day of the Lord. It is darkness and not light. As if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned his hand against the wall and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light, and gloom with no brightness in it? Now, why is that so? 
Because just as in Malachi's day, in the days before him of Amos, the people were wicked. And if God came among them in His righteousness and His holiness, there was but one outcome for them, and that was their condemnation. And so the children of Israel in Malachi's day saying, where is the God of judgment? They didn't know what they were asking. They were calling judgment upon their own heads. Now, the prophet uses two analogies for this judgment, for this purification. He refers to refining metal and to uh, a fuller's soap or a launderer of garments. And in both of these analogies, what is happening is the impurities are being removed so that a pure product is left. The refiner melts down the silver or the gold and in so doing, the dross rises to the top and is skimmed off so that only pure metal remains. The launderer in Malachi's day would have used alkali to separate the oil and the dirt so that a pure, clean garment was left. In both cases, the impurities are removed from what is pure. And Malachi says, this is what's going to happen among God's people. Among God's people, the impurities will be removed. And he starts there in verses 3 and 4 with the priests. Now when we back up in the book of Malachi, we see that the priests were corrupt. And as priests, they were supposed to be leading the people. And so he begins with the leadership and he purifies them first. Now what's interesting is when we turn over to our New Testament, we behold these things taking place. We know from John 2 and Matthew 21 that Jesus on more than one occasion purified or cleansed the temple. And we know from Acts chapter 6 and verse 7 that in the early days of the church that many of the priests were converted. Luke's summary statement there says, the word of God continued to increase and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. And so with the coming of John the Baptist to prepare the children of Israel, there were those among the nation of Israel who were purified. But there were also those among the nation of Israel who did not accept the preparation, but instead killed the Christ, the author of life. And in AD 70, God visited them with judgment as He destroyed the temple. See, that purification, it either reveals purity or removes impurity. Verse 5 of Malachi 3 makes it clear that in Malachi's day, the vast majority of the people were impure. They had broken faith and were unjust. It was not God who was failing in the area of justice, but His people who broke their covenant with Him and sinned against their fellow man. Look at all of the things that are listed in verse 5. In some way, they all reveal injustice. Whether it is injustice against a spouse, adultery, or swearing falsely probably means testifying in court as a false witness against someone, again, injustice, causing an innocent party to be counted guilty. Those who oppress the hired worker. And then that magic involved turning their backs on the God who had loved them and called them and separated them and made them a holy nation. And so it was not God who was failing in the area of justice but the children of Israel. Now what's interesting is God announces a coming judgment. He gives them an opportunity to repent. He gives them, like He has done so many times before in the Old Testament, a time of mercy 
in which they can prepare for His coming. And that's what John the Baptist comes on the scene to do. Have you ever witnessed a child in the act of wrong who is doing what they know is wrong and looking at their mother or their father or both just to see how they will respond? Testing their parents. And a lot of times what you'll see is mom or dad saying, I'm warning you. I'm going to give you to the count of three. Now if mom or dad is consistent, that count of three is a period of mercy and the end of it is swift punishment. God effectively says, I'm giving you a period of mercy, but judgment is coming. You know, there are people today who doubt the judgment of God, and that's not new. In 2 Peter chapter 3, I don't have it listed on the screen, there were people in Peter's day who were saying, he's not coming back. If he were coming back, he would have already come. And Peter gives a threefold answer in that chapter. First of all, Peter says, God's timing is not like your timing. With the, with the Lord, a day is a thousand years and a thousand years a day. God's timing is not like your timing. Second of all, He hasn't come back because He's a merciful God who wants to save as many people as possible. But third of all, understanding that His timing is not like our timing and He is giving us mercy and waiting, you better be ready. Because when He comes, there will be no excuses. Judgment will be swift and severe. And the same is true for us as well. It has not changed since that day. And so we ask, and we must each ask ourselves, am I ready? Am I ready? An Italian man sought his fortune in America. He came to this country to be a performer a juggler. And he made his living in this country, performing. And in his old age, he decided that he wanted to return to his homeland. And at that time, traveling by ship, he decided that it would be easier to sell all that he had and buy a diamond, which he could then sell when he returned home and make a, a modest living. So he boarded the ship with his life savings in the form of a diamond. And while on the ship, he came to amuse his fellow passengers by juggling. And he began by juggling everyday items like apples. But as the crowd's interest grew, his desire to entertain grew, and so he took his prized possession, his diamond, and began to juggle with it. And each time, he tossed it a little bit higher until the crowd became dismayed at the risk he was taking and they begged him to stop and he continued until finally uh, hearing their pleas he said I'll throw it one more time I'll toss it one more time and it'll go so high that for a moment you won't be able to see it but he was confident he'd been doing this for years that he could catch that diamond and so he tossed it high and it disappeared for a moment and then it came back into sight and the ship lurched and his life savings were lost forever into a vast ocean. Too many people are not juggling with their life savings but with their very lives. The Lord has promised that He is coming. Hebrews 9, 27 and 28 says, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. Not to deal with sin. He's already done that. But to save those who are eagerly waiting for Him. But what about those who aren't? Judgment. 
He will separate the pure from the impure, except we can't be pure apart from the blood of Jesus Christ. Are you ready for His coming? Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? Have you turned from your life of sin and confessed His name and been baptized in water? And are you walking faithfully in His sight? If you're not, judgment is coming. Now is the time. Now is the time to come to the author of life and accept His gift of life. If you need to respond, we're going to sing an invitation song. If you'll indicate that you would like to, we'll do anything that we can for you today. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to Thee. I am resolved to follow the Savior, faithful and true each day. Heed what He saith, do what He willeth, he is the living way. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to our next song together before the Lord's Supper is When My Love to Christ Grows Weak that's page 350 350 in our hymn books And we'll sing, uh, we'll sing all the verses together uh, as we now consider Christ and his sacrifice for us. Let us sing. When my love to Christ grows weak, when for deeper faith I seek, then in thought I go to thee, garden of Gethsemane. There I walk amid the shades, while the lingering twilight fades. See that suffering friendless one, weeping, praying there alone. When my love for man grows weak, when for stronger faith I seek, hill of Calvary I go to thy saints of fear and woe. There behold his agony suffered on the bitter tree. See his anguish, see his faith, love triumphant still in death. Then to life 
I turn again. The worth of pain, learning all the might that lies in a full self sacrifice. the opportunity to approach the throne of the Lord with the emblems before us. Christ made clear with his disciples that the bread is the body of Christ, the fruit of the vine is his blood. Christ has said that he who is part of him has to eat his body and drink his blood. Let us uh, reflect on ourselves as we partake of these emblems. Bow with me, please. Our Lord in heaven, we're thankful to be given the opportunity to come to you in prayer. We're thankful, Father, for the chance it is to be children of yours. We're thankful for the, the loaf, the representation of Christ's body. We pray, Lord, as we partake of this loaf, that you'll help us to understand what it is to be part of Christ's body, the sacrifice given on our behalf, the mercy and the grace we ask, Father, that you'll help us to understand and grow. These things are asked in Jesus' name. Amen. Power with him, please. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we continue to thank thee this morning for this crucified to a Christian represents the love of our Lord and Savior. He died a cruel death on the cross for our sins. We pray that each and every one of us take it this morning. We'll do this in a manner be well pleased in your eyes. This we ask in your son's name. Amen. Thank you, Clay, for a good message. Uh, as we leave, make sure we leave on the outside aisles, please. Uh, starting at the back pews first. And uh, your contribution plates are on the hall outside the doors let's go to God in prayer our father in heaven we come to you thank you for this Lord's day father and the blessings that you share with us each and every day father we ask you to be with those that's been mentioned here today be with the sick father be with the uh, ones that's not here that uh, maybe they can return uh, when this virus is over Father, we ask you now to be with us as we leave this place. Help us return to the next point in time. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>